Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everybody in the audience today. I'm Doug Sullivan, president of the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington, and it is our great pleasure to partner today with Gulf Intelligence to bring you the program, What's in Store for the Gulf Region in 2022. Uh, here in Washington, the sun is just peeking up over the horizon, and it's kind of a good metaphor for the beginning of the new year. We're just at the beginning. We have another 50 weeks of this year to look forward to. Uh, and frankly, last year, 2021, was a mixed bag. You saw some good things. You saw reconciliation within the GCC. You saw a tentative restart of nuclear negotiations with Iran. Um, you saw a lot of uh, regional diplomacy that we hope will bear fruit. But you also saw the realization in industry and in the region that uh, climate change and the energy transition are really coming, but that they're not gonna come about easily and the solutions and investments required are not always going to be clear. And you saw a world ravaged by sequential waves of coronavirus infections that stress healthcare systems and slowed down economies, making government health policy and economic policy very difficult. So um, I say good riddance to 2021, welcome 2022, but we need to figure out what the issues are that we have to look at in the coming year. And we have got a great panel to do that with you today. Uh, Omar Al-Ubaidli is a non-resident fellow at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington and has professional or research responsibilities at George Mason University, the Mercatus Center, King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals, and Trends UAE. He is a much published analyst who earned his BA in economics from the University of Cambridge and his MA and PhD in economics from the University of Chicago. Omar, thank you very much for joining us today. My pleasure. Uh, Laurie Hetayan directs the Middle East and North Africa programs of the National Resource Governance Institute. She's worked on parliamentary media and anti-corruption programs, uh, grassroots programs in Bahrain, Yemen, and Saudi Arabia, promoting the role of women in development and policymaking. And she holds a master's in Middle East politics from the University of Exeter and a BA in communications arts from the Lebanese American University. Uh, Laurie, it's great to have you with us today. Welcome. Uh, Hussein Ibish is a senior resident scholar at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. He is a weekly columnist for Bloomberg and The National in the UAE, and is also a regular contributor to many other U.S. and Middle Eastern publications. He has previously served as a senior fellow to the American Task Force for Palestine, communications director for the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee, and has a PhD, interestingly, in comparative literature from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Hussein, it's great to have you with us today. Thanks, so you can see the you can see the full biographies of all of our speakers on AGSIW's website, agsiw.org. <clears throat> now, since we only have an hour for today and have to tell you everything that's going to happen in the new year, uh, uh, we're going to start pretty quickly. But we also want you to use the chat function at the bottom of your screen if you've got specific questions you'd like us to address in this hour. So what I want to do is start out with Omar. And Omar, if I could ask you to give us a very short summary of the economic issues that you see facing the Gulf region and the Middle East for the coming year. So uh, first of all, thanks very much for the invitation to participate today. A, a quick overview of some of the interesting things to watch out for. Uh, let's start with economic growth and development. Uh, there's several models to watch. Saudi Arabia uh, is going to be growing fueled by primarily investment. Uh, it's, it's attracting, uh, uh, well, it's beginning to attract more foreign capital, but certainly it's investing its own capital heavily in lots of sectors it's traditionally ignored. Uh, and in addition, growth is going to be driven uh, by domestic, uh, the continued transition of the domestic economy. So you've seen that previously the, econ the economy was very much geared towards petrochemicals, hydrocarbons, and so on and so forth. But now if anyone's been to Real of late, you can see that there's a quite a dramatic transition underway, uh, both in terms of the economic activity itself and its uh, effects on employment. You see Saudi Arabians performing jobs that uh, would have been unthinkable. Uh, I was in the Eastern Province uh, a couple of weeks ago and you have female taxi drivers, female women working in, in retail in, in, in areas where it would not have seen uh, than do it like 20 years ago. And that's having, that's all increasing the growth of the economy and, and leading to a, a genuinely new uh, uh, economic growth model. How sustainable that is, is a separate issue, but certainly as far as 2022 is concerned, that's going to be important. The UAE is actually uh, undergoing something uh, quite unique. Uh, certainly the expo is going to be uh, a continued positive effect of the expo, but actually in terms of COVID, 
Uh, it's been out at the moment. It looks like a win. I know uh, people in Abu Dhabi, as uh, uh, Ambassador Suleiman mentioned at the beginning, are uh, suffering a, a mini lockdown at present. But in general, uh, the effective, uh, I would say, domestic statecraft by the UAE when it comes to dealing with COVID uh, and Dubai's, uh, you know, long-standing attractiveness to foreigners. Uh, has made it for the first time ever, I would say, highly attractive to elite uh, uh, people from OECD countries as a place to permanently settle. Uh, whereas the Bay would usually, you would have been somewhere that somebody might consider having as a holiday home or visiting once or twice a year. I think a lot of people in, in the West who are fed up with mismanagement of COVID and who are fed up with the political dysfunction of places like the US, the UK, uh, France and so on and so forth, I've reached a point that like I've had it. I'm just going to move to the UAE and I can live my life and not have to worry about, you know, schools opening and closing and, and, and uh, people being banned from Twitter and all this kind of thing happening on a daily basis. Uh, and that's going to be a, a big boon economically for the UAE because the people who are coming and not uh, are very, you know, have great means uh, and are looking to purchase property and to settle there permanently. In Bahrain, we have a, a completely different issue going on, which is that the government uh, ha, has performed uh, very well on the health side in terms of managing the pandemic, and that's, uh, uh, and that's led to uh, uh, an extra dose of legitimacy for the government's economic policy. Economic power has been consolidated in the, uh, uh, the new prime minister. Oh, he was appointed, he, he, took, he became prime minister, uh, uh, the crown prince at the end of 2020. He's been on uh, uh, with that role for a year now. Uh, and the extra legitimacy gain from good management of COVID means that the new economic strategy, which was just announced a couple of months ago, uh, is going to have a really good chance of unfolding at least as planned uh, uh, and with potentially uh, uh, positive impacts. We'll see through 2022. We'll all be watching how that unfolds. Very briefly, I'll uh, talk about uh, the fiscal side, uh, a couple of important issues. Saudi Arabia has been very successful in restructuring its finances. It's recorded a surplus, I think, a couple of quarters in a row. And I'm sure that other GCC countries will be watching and looking to implement some of the uh, restructuring that Saudi Arabia has done. And very exciting as well is, uh, well, not this exciting from the citizen's perspective, but from the analyst's perspective, is Oman going to introduce income tax in the middle of 2022. Uh, and again, income tax has been taboo and off the table for political reasons in all six GCC countries since their independence. Uh, uh, and Oman is going to be the one to uh, broach to breach that uh, uh, barrier. And I'm confident that all five other countries will be watching keenly and seeing how it's uh, uh, socially and politically uh, 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 you know, welcomed in the country. And finally, in trade, uh, what we're seeing is in the field of energy markets in 2022, uh, started a couple of years ago and is continuing and will be continuing robustly in 2022, is a manifestation of the classical liberal theory of international relations. The Middle Eastern countries with the US uh, making it clear to the world that it has no interest in intervening militarily to maintain peace or do anything significant in uh, the Middle East. Uh, uh, the Middle Eastern countries are using trade, especially trade in energy markets, to diffuse tensions and to uh, generate constructive uh, uh, relationships. Most recent example is, I believe, the UAE agreed to build solar power plants for Jordan, who will be supplying, so which will be supplying Israel. Okay, I mean, you know, ten years ago, that kind of arrangement would have been, uh, you know, unthinkable. Uh, but now. Israel needs energy, and it's going to, and in fact, it'll be importing a critical commodity from a country that you know historically has had antipathy towards, setting aside the peace treaty, constructed by the UAE, which is, I guess, technically been at war with Israel for God knows how many years. And to do this, you know, this is all, uh, 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 you know, the sort of thing that would make the likes of Thomas Paine and and uh, Montesk and Emmanuel Kant coo with uh, happiness at the thought of trade leading the way uh, uh, for peaceful relations. So that's a quick overview of things to watch for in 2022. Thank you very much, especially for that very optimistic uh, look at 2022. Uh, I'd like to turn next to Lori. Um, uh, Lori, there's been a lot of uh, concern in the Gulf and around the world about uh, possible competition between Gulf states, uh, but especially as Gulf states wrestle with the question of energy transition away from fossil fuels. So can you start a conversation by talking a bit about how you see energy transition affecting the countries of the Gulf? Uh, look, uh, let's say that energy uh, transition is uh, playing a good role 
in the region, like forcing the region uh, to think about the future of uh, energy and the future of the economy uh, or, or the economies of the country. So I see it being like really a, a door for investment and definitely, uh, you see, uh -huh, uh, so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, sit I'm sitting in Beirut and now we have an electricity cut. So, uh, but maybe Omar, we should send some of that power from Jordan to, to Beirut as well. Hey, <laughs> don't, don't laugh at that. <laughs> it is going to happen. It is going to happen. Jordan yeah. is going to send electricity uh, to Come Lebanon, on. and Egypt is going to send gas to Lebanon uh, through Syria. So, yeah. this is part of the interconnection that is happening in the region that Omar was talked about. So he talked about the UAE, Jordan, Israel. At the same mm -hmm. time, we are seeing a lot of interconnecting projects uh, through electricity, uh, through different kind of the, uh, of, the, uh, re, uh, of the members of the region. I know that there had been uh, projects before that never were implemented or there were pro problems connecting the region through electricity, et cetera. But I think now there is more of the environment of connecting uh, countries together, and as Omar said, using trade to connect uh, people. We are seeing this. We think that this will continue uh, in the Gulf and through the uh, uh, through the uh, Middle East or the Levant, if you want, on our side of the world. But to go back to uh, the initial, what we were discussing about energy uh, transition, I guess energy transition has been a, dr a driving force for the region to think about the future of energy, as I said. Uh, most importantly, I guess, what we're seeing that we felt that it was always the uh, Gulf or the Middle East uh, being uh, and the oil and gas sector being under attack. And we've seen a comeback for the Gulf saying that, look, guys, we do have the reserves of the world in oil and gas. Uh, the oil and gas will stay uh, relevant for the economy because the economy worldwide economy is not changing much demand we're not seeing this kind of organic demand being in, decreased uh, even though we're talking about oil demand uh, peak for years uh, so there will be relevant uh, relevant use of it and we want to be part of the uh, energy transition discussion and we want to set the agenda in what could be done or not and this is what we're seeing with a kind of uh, this is uh, what we're seeing. And now, definitely now we see that there are a lot of investment in oil and gas development in the region because the region knows that they have the low cost uh, product. They do have low emissions as well, like in, uh, in Saudi Arabia uh, in a couple of places. So they can still uh, uh, sell their product and still save the planet. At the same time, they're investing a lot in uh, energy transition uh, or renewable projects and green technologies. They're investing a lot on research to be part of the discussion and not to be seen as the bad guys polluting the, uni the uni universe on the country. They are contributing in different ways. And definitely they see that in, uh, uh, in the long run, when now everybody's talking about supply shortages, that these people, the, the region, will be the ones that will be the last man standing and they will continue investing and supplying when demand is needed, even though demand might be decreasing. Again, that would mean if demand is decreasing, that would mean that we should expect lower prices for oil and gas, which means that we need really to invest in diversification. And this is what we are seeing. We are seeing really a serious drive into diversifying the economy we're not talking about energy diversification, but in the economy where we're seeing all these steps taken seriously about diversifying and get like, because they know in the future, they need to have an economy that is not completely reliant on oil and gas. But everything that used to be talk, 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 now we're seeing now, no, there is action that is uh, being uh, uh, taken. I stop here um, and then go back to, to OPEC and the OPEC Plus later. Okay, th thank you, Lori. Uh, Hussein, uh, let me ask you to sort of uh, overlay everything we've heard from Omar and Lori on the economic and energy side with uh, the regional and uh, global uh, geopolitical laydown. Okay, I mean, at the strategic level, if, if I jump up to 30,000 feet, which is where I usually like to cruise, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really interesting, actually, we're one of the most fascinating periods, because 
we are now into a phase of consolidating what is becoming not just a period, but even a little era of de-escalation and a switch from confront from a, at least a decade of confrontation and conflict, whether direct or indirect for the, uh, the powers in the, in the whole Middle East, in, in, including the Gulf for sure, uh, from those who try to pr project their power uh, through a confrontation and even conflict, as I say, either directly by getting in, engaged on the ground, you know, uh, whether it's Iran with its its own forces in various neighboring countries or the Saudi-led Arab coalition in Yemen, various countries getting involved in Libya, et cetera, all over the place, or indirectly through proxies, uh, which is the main way Iran projects its influence and others do engage in it on a much lesser, much less a centralized, vertically integrated basis. We've shifted now uh, to, because of uh, many, for, uh, many factors, we've shifted into an era of what I like to call consolidation, retrenchment, and maneuver. And the, the main point of that now is maneuver. And maneuver means a reliance on diplomacy, commerce, and politics to secure your national interest rather than confrontation, and especially rather than conflict. Now, uh, I think we're out because this is now almost well into the second, not just the second year, but past the two year mark that this has started happening. And I don't think we realized fully that it was upon us uh, until it was well underway sort of a year and a half ago. Um, and, and certain countries, UAE most in particular, took the lead in this and, and has embraced it most thoroughly. Now we're in a position of analyzing less why it's happening, right? The overextension, exhaustion, depletion of these countries. I mean, above all, the, the stronger they are, the more overextended they are. Turkey, the very strongest, was the most overextended, the most exhausted and had, you know, basically no friends left <laughs> a year and a half ago or so. Uh, but all of them are to some extent overextended, depleted, and in some cases exhausted. It's time for them to deal with their own situation. The U.S. pulling back from the region means that strategic diversification for its both friends and foes alike is, is um, more necessary than ever. And that's been truer even longer uh, than this. And uh, of course, there are these additional problems that have come up, COVID, the devastation of, of the economy because of that, the need to cooperate because of that, uh, the uh, pressing need for transition in the Gulf from energy-centered economies uh, and uh, various other pressures. Uh, climate change, obviously, the question of the long-term habitability of the Gulf, et cetera, all of these things have pushed. So we need to go beyond looking at what caused this and look at where is it going. And there, I think we need to begin looking at what is strong, what is promising, and what is potentially still very weak and dangerous in this new era, in, in the de-escalation de and maneuver process. Um, on the strong side, you can see things that are clearly strategic changes that are not going anywhere. The UAE-Israel partnership is uh, the best example of that. This is a strategic change, and I have a very hard time imagining any situation dire enough to break that partnership. Uh, I think uh, UAE-Bahrain relationship is uh, very strong, but it's simpler. It's, it's based on mutual antipathy to Iran mainly. Uh, but the, the UAE-Israel partnership is multifaceted, has at least 12 major components all moving at the same time going forward. And I think that's very strong. What's promising but questionable? Well, on the more um, let's say solid end is the reconciliation with uh, between the uh, Gulf countries that were boycotting Qatar and Qatar. That looks pretty strong because the really the Muslim Brotherhood is no longer a factor in the in the Arab world. The Muslim Brotherhood project has utterly collapsed, and that's become very clear in the past two or three years. It's not the threat that it was post Arab Spring. It's not the threat that it was when Turkey looked like it might be trying to set up a Sunni Islamist regional network. It's just collapsed. It, it's not at the moment a viable threat. That means it's not difficult for um, the boycotting countries to reconcile with Qatar because Qatar's support for the Brotherhood and Sunni Islamists is not the kind of threat that it was. Uh, and similarly, uh, there's a, a great need because of the uh, threats that I talked about before to consolidate. That also opened the door for reconciliation with Turkey. Turkey also, as I said, you know, depleted, exhausted with an economic crisis, needs support and investment. So the Turkish dialogue is also very promising. So not as promising as the Qatar reconciliation, which looks very strong to be almost strategic, not quite, but almost. The Turkish one is where you could see investments and above all infrastructure leading to solidity that cushions 
the, the Turkish uh, Gulf rapprochement from being uh, destabilized by a sudden burst of, of confrontation and, uh, and um, a return to kind of hostile attitudes. And I think the uh, attitude, the, the approach from the UAE uh, looking at investments in Turkey, and I think you're going to see Saudi Arabia following suit uh, very soon. I think mean, it's obvious, and it's been obvious for many months that they were going to follow suit, is a kind of an effort to use investments and above all infrastructure to, to kind of give Turkey a lot of incentives uh, to think twice about again becoming aggressively hegemonic or, or taking a stance that conveys that impression, right? Uh, the weakest link here is the dialogue and opening with Iran. I think that's obvious. I think the, it's very, very, very weak. You can see how little progress has been made in the uh, dialogue in Baghdad between Riyadh and Tehran. Um, obviously, the potential collapse of the JCPOA opens one area of potential instability, though I have always thought there might be an agreement reached, and I'm seeing a lot of signs that there might be an agreement reached. Anyone who just gave up completely was being way too uh, confident that they knew what was going on behind the scenes. I think there's a lot of signs that serious things are happening in Vienna. So don't count that out, but it's still uh, a heavy lift. And if it fails, it's gonna require a containment regime from all of Iran's antagonists led by the United States. It's gonna ratchet up pressure tremendously. And that brings into play the other fault line to do with Iran, which is Iran's network of armed gangs, of militias in neighboring states, in, in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in uh, Yemen, to some extent in Bahrain, small level, but still, and uh, in other places. And that's obviously another fissure, especially as the PMFs in Iraq start working, it seems like, you know, in a much less vertically integrated manner, apparently disregarding Iran's interests regarding uh, the assassination attempt on the prime minister and things like that. So you do have uh, a lot of potential problems that could throw the region back into conflict, especially centered on Iran. I just want to say, look at infrastructure. Infrastructure gives you the best bet for a, a, a structural deep-seated um, protection from a return to confrontation and conflict. Right. Hussein, thank you very much. And I want to pick up on that last point and go back to Lori, because uh, the, the, the drop of your power in Beirut has given us a really good opening to talk about the potential and what you see as the, the kinds of specific projects in infrastructure, interconnections, certainly electricity, Eastern Med training natural gas, uh, Omar, you can jump in as well, because the GCC has been talking about linking rail lines and finding uh, new trade routes that do not go through the Strait of Hormuz. So, Lori, can you tell us the trends that you see a little bit more specifically now in interconnection of infrastructure uh, in the, the Eastern Mediterranean um, and the Gulf? Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, look, before Eastern Mediterranean uh, uh, and Gulf, uh, let me go to Greece, which is kind of considered like kind of like East Mediterranean. We do consider it as as part of the, the group. So uh, lately there was this whole uh, outrage from, uh, if you want, uh, from the Greek uh, government because the U.S. had made a statement that they're not very much interested anymore about the East Med pipeline. That was the, that was a plan, a pipeline that should have started in Israel, go through Cyprus and Greece. And there, after Greece, uh, initially it was supposed to go to Italy and then Italy didn't want it anymore. So it, it is a pipeline that, that definitely, uh, it's a gas pipeline that the US was interested in. Uh, Israel, Greece, Cyprus wanted it to be a, a, an in, a, a, a particularly like an int a pro interesting project for the, for the EU to fund as well. And, uh, and they were for years working on that and pushing and pushing, doing feasibility studies, making promises, trying to find uh, funders, donors for it and uh, investors for it. Uh, so now the US is saying like, guys, I'm, we're not that much interested in the pipeline, but we're very much interested in electricity interconnectors between, mm -hmm. the, uh, between our region, like East Med or Asia, if you want, or our part of Asia and and euro and uh, that says a lot about the future uh, common projects or the infrastructure project so before that we had different mous signed between the egyptians and the europeans about interconnecting electricity the same that we are having about different projects in the region here between the gulf and uh, uh, egypt israel 
uh, and other places about this interconnecting electricity. And lately, as it was mentioned, the UAE Jordan Israel project is one <laughs> of these projects that are, I think, the future thinking of what projects could do, look like. And basically, yeah. what is happening is like Jordan needs water, Israel yeah. needs clean energy or clean electricity. So, right. and then, uh, so the project was that they they do uh, that the Jordanians with the UAE investment they do a big uh, uh, solar farm and then the ener- the electricity goes to jo- Israel and right. Israel in return gives them uh, clean water. This Good. is the kind of collaboration that we are seeing in the region. And uh, definitely, if these projects uh, go through, and if these projects uh, are not stopped at any moment because of politics, if they go through, if they're implemented, let's say, and politics that does not interfere in a way that would cut these kind of infrastructures, so for instance, uh, when uh, not to compare, but I'm just saying that, for instance, when Morocco and Algeria had the problem, Algerians uh, cut the infrastructure to Morocco, you know, or yeah. uh, flows that go to Morocco. These kind of things that are not uh, elements that would raise the trust and, or confidence, and these are not confidence building measures. So therefore, then you could become hesitant saying that, or should we have this much of connection when we're not very sure at any moment a conflict could affect yeah. this kind of structure, infrastructure? Or should we say that, no, we need to push for more of this interconnectivity through different means being uh, uh, so that it will bring more peaceful moments in the region? So I think that is the very interesting uh, uh, thinking that is happening. Yeah. Uh, about the potential of this region, the Gulf and the uh, other Arab uh, region uh, countries and Israel, about how what this region should be looking like economically, yeah. connected through energy, connected to trade, and etc. So Two I think this points. is oh, the sorry. trend. Sorry. This is the trend, yeah. in, uh, that is, that we're going to see yeah. uh, uh, more and more. That would require a lot of political understanding and trust between countries and that would be uh, i guess a novelty in the region because not every country trusts the other in the region yeah. <laughs> and there two are quick different points on that if I, if I may two quick points one is also look at iraq jordan egypt I and mean, there's a long-term trend to try to rebuild that old triangle right that that is very important potentially it, it links right right across uh, between the, the Asian Middle East into North Africa, very, very important. And it was historically a strong one, and it could be again, especially in terms of Iraq's you know, relative independence. Now, the other thing I wanted to say is um, everything you're saying, especially on LNG and the Eastern Med, goes to changing fortunes uh, for uh, Turkey in Libya, because the reason that the main reason the Turks went so hard into Western Libya to rescue the GNA from a potential threat, right, from the Benghazi Tobruk regime and, and the Haftar forces, was that Misrata is key to Turkey's claims on an LNG zone in the Eastern Med, right? They had that agreement they had with that, you know, very shaky government in, in Tripoli that holds Misrata, which is really the important place in Western uh, Libya, not Tripoli. Um, is, is absolutely crucial to Turkey's claims. Now, as the LNG argument has kind of cooled down a bit, and as we've entered into this period of trying to figure out agreements, I think you could see that two things have happened in Libya. One is uh, Turkey's anxiety about um, holding this area and about you know sort of losing this claim has gone down. And the other is, of course, they've run into real problems with their frenemies in, inside Libya itself, and they may find themselves really in, in big trouble in Western Libya if things keep going the way they are. Anyway, sorry. I mean, I, Omar, I want to come to you, and I, I know you have comments. I also want to ask you to bring it back a little bit to the Gulf and talk about some of the longstanding GCC integration of infrastructure uh, projects. Uh, on rail, on trade, but uh, even on uh, uh, sharing the power grids between Kuwait and Iraq, which is a long-standing dream, which hasn't really been realized. So in addition to whatever else, the other comments you had on what Laurie was saying. Yeah, so building on what Laurie uh, uh, was saying, and also what Hussein mentioned regarding the, uh, the Qatar crisis and, and the fact that that's in the rearview mirror, in another victory for the classical liberal international relations tradition, throughout the Gulf crisis, 
uh, the one of the institutions which continued to work uh, totally uh, and with 100% efficiency with the, was the GCC Interconnection Authority, which is the yep. grid. Uh, uh, and and that includes, uh, it's not part of GCC IA, but also there was the pipeline, the Dolphin pipeline that links uh, Qatar to UAE. And UAE continued to import gas according to the long-term contract yep. it has with Qatar. Uh, and uh, that shows that, again, you know, the uh, trade trumped war, so to speak, or trumped conflict. Uh, and uh, the uh, and now, as you mentioned, in the case of Kuwait and Iraq and, and in Saudi Arabia is clearly, you know, so Iran, uh, I think, miscalculated with its uh, uh, sort of bullying Iraq with, you know, technical problems in their, in their electricity supply during hot summers, during elections and so on, because it's opened the door for Saudi Arabia to be a credible source of energy uh, to Iraq uh, long term. Uh, uh, and that would be a great boon for the region, to be honest, because it would make things more peaceful. It would, again, decrease tensions and also certainly for Saudi Arabia. I would also add that in the specific case of GCC countries, one of the reasons why energy trade both within the GCC and with other areas is so, in, uh, so attractive is because of the issue of innovation. The Gulf countries have always struggled to innovate and to, uh, which is ultimately the source of the, the only sustainable source of economic growth. Uh, uh, and energy provides them a, 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 the most credible path for having homegrown innov innovation and technological advancement in a sustainable way. Uh, traditionally, that's been in, you know, downstream petrochemicals, uh, like, you know, uh, things like Sabek and uh, in Saudi Arabia. But now they can actually be credible sources of uh, technological progress in solar energy. In, you see Saudi Arabia has hydrogen uh, in desalination technologies. Uh, and we'll look to export that to the rest of the with it amongst themselves and to the rest of the region and then eventually to the rest of the world. Uh, and in particular, it's the kind of innovation, some types of innovation require uh, a level of social and political openness, which isn't really available in the Gulf. For example, if you wanted to have a Hollywood in, in the Gulf, it wouldn't really work because you need to have, you know, you know artists need to have certain, you know, uh, no barriers in order to be able to produce the kind of things that, uh, people like to consume across the world. But when it comes to energy, the sort of technical, uh, oh, since we've lost uh, our chairman, uh, but in terms of energy, uh, if you want to, uh, the good thing about energy is that you can, from the perspective of uh, societal openness, is you can actually get a lot of technical innovation done and a lot of economic growth relating to that without having to, you know, provide the sort of social openness you see in somewhere like the UK or somewhere like the US. Uh, so uh, add to all that the bottom line, which is that energy is big, big business. It's big money. Uh, and there's a lot of money to be made. Uh, we have a country the size of Iraq, which is struggling to get reliable energy. A country like Lebanon is struggling with it. A country like Israel, Jordan, Egypt. There's a lot of money to be made. And hopefully, as I say, uh, the, the fixation on extracting that money can help people realize that it is, it's better to uh, trade rather than fight. Uh, thank you, Omar. Um, I'm going to go to Hussein for just a minute and pick up on one of the things that you mentioned about the, uh, the strategic change in the relationship between Israel and the Gulf. Can you talk a little bit about the Abraham Accords, um, the differences between you, uh, the Bahrain Treaty, the, the uh, UAE Treaty, and frankly, who might be next and how this could develop going forward politically as well as economically? Okay. So, I mean, I think that the, the interest of each of the countries that have opened uh, to Israel over the past couple of years, UAE, Bahrain, and the Gulf, in addition, Sudan and uh, Morocco, all had completely different asks, mainly of the United States. Um, Sudan wanted to get off the terrorism list, wanted some aid, they got that. Morocco wanted their uh, claims on Western Sahara uh, either ratified or at least, you know, uh, the U.S. sort of removing objections. <clears throat> they wouldn't go forward until Biden confirmed that he was not going to overturn Trump's tweet suggesting the U.S. recognizes that, that happened. So the Americans are going forward. They have, you know, it's a territorial demand, right? Uh, very bad for international law, very good for Moroccan aspirations, fine. Um, it, it, Bahrain, I think, honestly, the main thing is Bahrain has a different fear of Iran than anybody else. It, it, Bahrain lives under what I think a lot of Bahraini uh, feel 
is a suspended death sentence, not from the Islamic Republic, but from Iran Tut Court, because Iran has a longstanding territorial claim on Bahrain. The Shah tried to grab it when it became independent. And I don't think anyone in Bahrain believes, and I wouldn't, that the Islamic Republic has changed their mind on that. And I think there's a great fear and a rational fear of Iran in Bahrain that's completely different from anybody else's fear, right? Because it's the fear not of hegemony, but of being swallowed up. And so I think it's only rational for Bahrain to make common cause with the country that is doing the military heavy lifting in, uh, in Iraq, in Syria, and potentially in Lebanon against Iran's proxy gangs that project its influence in the Arab world. This just makes sense. And I, I think doing anything else would have been ridiculous if it's possible. It became possible. The UAE has a broad ranging partnership with Israel. They're very similar countries in certain respects, small countries. With, with big military footprints, with high tech um, engagement, the interest because of that with small population, but big security concerns, and they have an interest in the same kinds of technologies, right? Electronic warfare, cyber technology, imaging, uh, sensing, remote stuff. They're interested in space. They're interested in health technology. They're interested in R&D. Uh, the uh, UAE defense industry has become really viable. It's a major exporter of defense weapons. It's in the, the top 10, you know, so regionally, uh, the, the amount of Middle Eastern countries that buy UAE weaponry is extraordinary. If you look at the figures, it's, it's really remarkable. Uh, and of course, Israel has this major uh, defense industry. So a lot of the things UAE wants to do, Israel is doing for the same reason or similar reasons, and it's a generation ahead or two. So when UAE looks at its model, and looks around the region for partners, it's only the Israelis. They're the only ones playing the same game with the same constraints and the same realities. And the same. So it's a natural partnership, but it's multifaceted across the board. Um, and I think it's very strong because of that. I think really, you know, it, I can't imagine, it would take some kind of huge conflagration in the Holy Basin over the Al-Aqsa Mosque or in the holy sites of Jerusalem to, to even shake this, right? Nothing in Gaza is going to do that, uh, you know, and, and it didn't even dent it when there was such an issue. So I think it's very solid. Who's next? Right. So the obvious <laughs> next candidate. Well, the obvious next candidate is Saudi Arabia, but I don't think the Saudis are ready to go there yet. And it's going to take a lot more maneuver uh, to get Saudi Arabia to be willing to do this. They have internal questions about their own politics, which are very complicated and large with 30 million people. They also have a regional Arab leadership role that they don't particularly want, but they have to carry out and a global Islamic leadership role that they do want and they fought for. And this would heavily influ influence those. So they have to be very careful. So I don't see them going this direction any time in the immediate future, but they are keeping their options open. And that's wise. Um, you've got a comment, please. I've got uh, one point on Bahrain, one point on UAE, one shared interest. So uh, a uniquely Bahrain interest, in addition to the one I said mentioned, is that Bahrain is cultivating uh, a national identity and an international yeah. reputation for being a country which is tolerant uh, and, and multi-ethnic and multi-confessional and so on and so forth. And therefore, you know, having good relations with Israel advances that, uh, yeah. that, that uh, sort of, uh, you know, projected... It's sort of shared identity. vision with the UAE. There's a, there's a nexus there. Yeah. And, then, and then from the UAE side, something that's more unique to the UAE is that UAE... Uh, wants a shortcut to homegrown innovation capacity. Yeah. And Israel has is very innovative. It has a lot of good innovators, but their economy is not well managed. Uh, right. And those, those uh, innovators are often stifled by the, uh, you know, uh, the uh, inadequacies tape. of the uh, domestic economic environment in Israel. And if they can go to UAE, they can still maintain their familial ties with Israel and then but have a nice place to settle in play and so forth. And then in a joint additional interest, is that uh, is the US uh, dealing with the US, getting the US to do your bidding in the Middle East is becoming more difficult uh, and being part of a, a clique or, or what looks like a multi, you know, multi-sided uh, regional bloc uh, with it, which is diverse, Bahrain, UAE, Israel, uh, certainly gives uh, US policymakers more pause for thought and it's much more likely to have leverage when Israelis go and demand something from the US political establishment, it's much easier for them to get what they want if they say, look, Bahrain's on board, UAE's on board, and the same uh, is true for all three. So I'd say that all uh, uh, are additional to what uh, uh, same. I think uh, all these uh, uh, 
all the political uh, rapprochement that is uh, happening and now adding Turkey again to the fold where we are seeing like the, the UAE uh, kind of bailing out uh, uh, Turkey when the lira was really uh, uh, weak, uh, the UAE coming in and uh, being interested in investing in, 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 in Turkey. I think Lebanese were not very happy for that because they are used to that, like where the, the Gulf com comes in and puts money in, in the Lebanese banks. Uh, so, uh, but again, we've seen that. And then uh, Turkey now going uh, to, uh, I think Erdogan is going to visit uh, Saudi Arabia. So I think that kind of rapprochement. But the big question is, um, uh, uh, I guess everybody is thinking of like what to do with Iran. Uh, um, and yes. No, uh, go so, ahead. And just yeah. finish up and, and I'll have a question. Yes. So I think the, the big question is about uh, Iran. Uh, yes, there are discussions between Iran and Saudi Arabia uh, about uh, uh, like definitely about Yemen. Yemen is an important uh, issue for Saudi Arabia, and they would want to discuss that with the Iranians. Since the JCPOA deal or a renewed deal or what is happening in Vienna, if you want to say the mm -hmm. Vienna talks don't want to go into uh, discussions beyond uh, the uh, nuclear and beyond the sanctions. They want to stick it uh, to that two uh, issues and they don't want to discuss the Iranians, at least they don't want to discuss the ballistic uh, missile right, issues, right. Uh, Iran's interference in the region. So therefore, I think the Americans, they were like, OK, with that, obviously, to discuss only nuclear and sanctions. Uh, so the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Saudis are dealing with the Iranians about of like, course. OK, so what are we going to do uh, with this? I do believe like very much that now the Saudis are very much interested in building their economy. So as yeah, we yeah. said, they, um, they know that even if they are the last man standing, even if they will continue to supply whatever uh, uh, oil and gas is needed uh, uh, for the future economies, uh, but they know that they need to diversify. And this is what they are doing, basically. Yeah. We... They, are bringing, they are growing yeah. their economy so that yeah. these, their, their non-oil economy grows, they are doing that. And I think they're more preoccupied about their internal uh, economy and how to grow their economy. They're yeah. not very much, I don't feel that there is appetite that the U, now Saudi Arabia wants to play a political role in the region. And we feel that that switch, there is a switch to the UAE yeah. where maybe the UAE had been for years growing their economy and being less vocal politically on the scene and letting Saudi Arabia do that. Now we see the shift that the UAE, exactly. The UAE is playing that role. We see that the UAE right. is going to discuss with the Syrians to see like what could be done. Is it possible to work with, uh, with, uh, with the re uh, Syrian regime or not? They are going in different places. Taking looking, the risks, yeah. Exactly. And, uh, and taking a bit that burden from the Saudis the so that Saudis. the Saudis could really focus on their internal economy. Yeah. And I think the uh, Crown Prince would want to continue working on the economy of the, the country. Uh, we know that uh, uh, yesterday, today, tomorrow, there is the big mineral uh, summit uh, going on in right. Riyadh. They want to invest in min 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 minerals and critical minerals that are very important for the energy transition as well. So they're tra trying to so, invest so there, attract investment etc. So this is the, the, the kind of what we are seeing. The UAE playing that foreign minister's office of uh, uh, officer or foreign right. minister of the GCC and Saudi Arabia really working on the economy side yeah. and thinking about connecting religion together. If it's we want what I was going to gonna ask you to, to uh, elaborate on because you made that point about the switching roles. I wanted to invite um, both of you to comment on how these countries can balance uh, relations between the U.S. and China. I have some thoughts on it myself. My sense, let me just throw a couple of ideas out there and get your reactions. First is, obviously, uh, Gulf foreign ministers and, and other senior um, foreign policy figures have made it very clear, especially the UAE has been blunt, but Saudi Arabia too and others, that one of their top foreign policy priorities is to prevent a new U.S.-China Cold War in which they would be forced by one or both sides to choose between their main strategic partner and their biggest um, uh, customer and, you know, growing strategic uh, presence in the region. And that's a nightmare. In addition to which, though, it seems to me there's a very strong 
a drive from uh, UAE, Saudi, other Gulf countries to, to build ties with China to make sure that in the long run, it's not only Persian voices that are heard in Beijing from the Gulf, but other voices as well. In other words, to make sure that China has multiple inputs from the region in it and, and multiple considerations and not just this increasingly mature relation with Beijing. And then the other point I'd like to see you react to is the idea that uh, China is basically at this point getting out of its shell of just being mercantile, but it's looking for areas that are under invested in where there's a competitive advantage, where there are vacuums that they can come into and get a foothold there by doing things that other global powers, whether investment or strategic presence, has just not done. And that it's going to be very hard for Washington to, to push them aside. They can draw red lines on Huawei or on military infrastructure, it becomes harder and harder as it goes into those under-invested areas. So what do you think about that? So uh, I would say that First of all, you know, when it comes to the U.S. Cold War with, with China, the U.S. really, I mean, to font of a better phrase, needs to get its act together. They can't seem to get out of their own way in terms of executing foreign policy. It's something you and I have discussed in person and even sometimes on Twitter and in other fora. Uh, U.S. Uh, foreign policy is, you know, barely coherent. And, and, uh, and as I think you've explained to me in the past, it seems to be uh, a victim of domestic uh, uh, political tensions uh, and isn't performing its function its correct function, which is, you know, advancing U.S. interests abroad, uh, if the U.S. Uh, and, and and as a consequence, uh, uh, the Gulf countries, you know, for the time being, I don't think it's so much of a choice between the two because the U.S. can't. Uh, the U.S.'s ability to exert pressure uh, on other countries seems to be com severely compromised by its inability to do anything coherent uh, in its foreign policy. Uh, in, in all the arenas that I see it trying to uh, exercise its power, you know, you have, you have, it has its hard military power. There's no question about that. But when it comes to this diplomatic power, as I say, it's it, it, and I, for a while, I mistakenly, it appeared, seemed to think that it was something specific to Trump. But I think it's the weaknesses are continuing under Biden, and 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 it's you know due to the person to the weakness of his administration, just as much as it is to the dysfunctional factors you uh, you describe. So China. Uh, is uh, is as you mentioned, seeing opportunities and and, and seeking them. But uh, uh, what I will say is that um, one aspect of the U.S.'s involvement in the Middle East that I can see, and this is something I mentioned previously in, in other seminars, is that uh, uh, the U.S. wants to maintain a considerable hard presence in the Middle East because it recognizes that the Middle East is a source of energy to China. And it wants to control one way of maintaining leverage over China is controlling those energy supplies. China continues to get significant amounts of oil from Iran, oil from Saudi Arabia, from all the Gulf states, uh, and uh, and also countries that trade heavily with China get their oil from the Middle East. Uh, and so the U.S. Uh, the, one one of the few things it seems to be able to do properly in its foreign policy is maintain. Uh, security uh, uh, hegemony over the waterways of the, uh, the Gulf, which means that it will continue to have, uh, uh, you know, the China bites throat when it comes to its uh, energy supplies. Uh, let, me, let me jump in here. I may turn my video off in hopes that uh, only my voice will come through and not my, my beautiful face. Um, I, I, I want to, first of all, pick up an interesting question going a completely different direction. Question from the audience about uh, the just begun two year stint of the UAE on the UN Security Council. And maybe Hussein, you can start on this, but how do you expect the UAE to use its uh, power on the Security Council, its influence in the next two years, uh, both regionally and globally. And Laurie and Omar, if you've got other thoughts, please do uh, jump in when Hussein's done. Yeah, I, I have some thoughts. I mean, I think it's it, the UA is perfectly suited to this. I think Laurie's insight about a switch uh, in roles between uh, Abu Dhabi and Riyadh is exactly right. I, I think she makes a good point there. It's a little bit contingent on countries working together, though, because UAE, for all its capabilities, remains a, a pretty a small and vulnerable actor. Um, so it can do this, but only with cooperation of others, right? It can play that role as a leader, but not, not carry too much of the burden. In the, in the Security Council, I think what it can do is it can represent an Arab perspective, but one that's very attuned to the global register, one that is not interested in sort of um, 
challenging either uh, side in the glowing divide between the West on one side and uh, China and Russia on the other side. It's really an extension of its mediating role, its balancing role. And I think it will uh, try to advance <clears throat> kind of consensus Arab positions, but in a way that moderates them. Uh, I think we've seen other countries use that role as a soapbox to try to claim to be more Watani and Qawmiya than everybody else and, and, and try to kind of put in resolutions that are implausible and are kind of meant for PR. I don't expect the UAE to do that. I expect the UAE to be um, very sober and cautious about how it uses its role. And that's in keeping with that leadership role that Lori has explained so well, and also with its, its model of trying to kind of move beyond the received unwisdom of the past. Let me also go to another question from the audience. It is picking up on the themes that Laurie and Omar were talking about earlier about regional inter interconnectivity, uh, joint infrastructure, um, and also trade and diplomacy. We've talked about how this works from the Gulf to the West. What about from the Gulf to the East, particularly with Iran? Is there a role for joint infrastructure projects, uh, diplomacy, trade, uh, in the context of U.S. and other international sanctions on Iran to improve the relationship between the Gulf and Iran? So uh, I would say, you know, uh, briefly, you know, Iran uh, doesn't have a good reputation uh, as being an investment partner or as being a source of debt investment. You know, it, it's, it's expropriated uh, explicitly, I think, uh, uh, you know, the oil company, international oil company. And since then, people trying to do business in Iran have been stifled by the, you know, Ira Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps and, uh, 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 you know, who, who, who them and their affiliates uh, will enter tenders and will win tenders uh, the easy way or the hard way. So I don't think at this stage in time, uh, in terms of, co you know, shared investment, anybody will be looking to invest with Iran unless uh, it cultivates uh, a better reputation as being a reliable investment partner. However, trade in, in, in goods and services uh, is certainly something that's on the table. And I believe, you know, Iran is a significant trading partner of the UAE. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, the UAE and, and, and Iran was also invested in terms of purchasing significant amounts of real estate and, and other projects in the UAE as well. And that can only be a good thing in terms of, you know, again, sounding like a, a broken record, but classical liberal trade theory, having these kind of things uh, uh, tend to decrease the, the, the levels of, of mutual antipathy. Uh, but in terms of joint projects, I don't see that as being a reliable option uh, anytime soon. And Laurie, I, I want to go, and I missed a big chunk of the conversation, but I don't think we've covered this yet, uh, back to the idea of the involvement of the Gulf in OPEC and OPEC+. Plus. We saw in the past year um, what appears to be a significant difference in the strategy of the UAE and Saudi Arabia in focusing either on short-term profits from oil revenue or longer-term market uh, preservation, and that played into some tension in OPEC+. Plus. What do you see in this dynamic in the coming year or coming years? Uh, look, uh, I see that uh, they've done uh, very well, uh, like in catering for their needs, and it didn't end up with, with being a dramatic uh, uh, a crisis. So, and I think that we will continue seeing these kind of uh, different incentives or different uh, drives, etc. But with the uh, with this with the uh, aim that everything could be solved with uh, any uh, very uh, um, um, uh, as we say brotherly way. So, and because the aim of the region is to really be a stable region, what that attracts investment in different sides. As I said, minerals, now we're going into minerals and they want investors in, in different directions, in, in different uh, trades, infrastructure, in any kind of investment, there is a need to invest in the energy transition uh, investment, so the uh, green energy, et cetera, technologies, etc. So I don't think there is an appetite for any kind of conflict in the, in the Gulf. There is more of a stable, mm -hmm. a strong investment uh, uh, attraction uh, for it. So uh, at, uh, what we see is like, again, uh, to go back to how, what the impact of energy transition is. Today, we see all the investments that is, are being made in the UAE. As you know, they were like pledges to have um, uh, uh, billions put into the energy sector to increase the capacity of the UAE to, uh, I guess, 5 million barrels per day. Uh, Saudi Arabia is investing 
uh, Qatar is investing in its gas uh, 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 sector. Uh, the, the, so, uh, the Kuwaitis are investing. The Iraqis that have the, the uh, that have the the ability to grow uh, their uh, their sector. Uh, they want this uh, this uh, uh, to invest and continue investing now because it is important. As I said, because they believe that if there is uh, there the, the investment or the investors will stop investing in, in or even if the international oil companies will stop investing, you will have these countries where they have strong NOCs that will continue investing in, supply, in oil and gas so that they can supply the, need, the future uh, needs. At the same time, all this money is needed for other projects that, uh, that the governments want to do to diversify uh, their economies. So whatever uh, the differences are, I guess, but the main idea is like to continue collaborating and cooperating uh, in, the, in the region. And basically, uh, this, is, this was the uh, success of OPEC, OPEC Plus during like 2020 and 2021. Uh, the, uh, the, the collaboration that had happened between the countries, the collaboration and understanding between Russia and Saudi Arabia was very important. So for this OPEC plus, uh, uh, um, um, if you want agreement to continue all these years and to navigate through these hard times. Uh, and I think it will continue. But at the same time to take in mind that, uh, for instance, for me, it's something that I, uh, I, I'm always thinking, let's say that what happens if, if Russia goes into Ukraine? What will be Saudi Arabia's position? What will be the UAE's position? If the, uh, the US and the EU definitely will take the side of Ukraine, how will that impact uh, the, the understanding on OPEC plus? Uh, will, will the Saudis and uh, the other side by uh, Russia, will that, what, that will, uh, what that would mean? Would that mean that for, because of that, for instance, the Americans would want to push with the JCPOA? You know, we're asking big questions here. It doesn't, make, it doesn't mean that this is what, we, that what is on, on paper or what people are thinking, but it is important as, as analy analysts to predict what future problems could be to think about like if yeah. these things happen. But this is, but there is, so, I think there is a confidence and trust in the market that OPEC, OPEC Plus will continue working together to navigate through these hard times. And definitely they, we started the year in 2021 with $50, we ended up now with $83, I yeah. think. The producers are very happy, OPEC Plus, they're very happy, and they would want to see the fruits of that collaboration continue the longest because, uh, because it's, it, 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 it's working. Them. It's yeah. working. Yeah. Even it's though the Americans them. are not very happy and they're always asking for... <laughs> so, look, I don't, I don't know the answer to the Ukraine question, um, but uh, I'd say two quick things. First, I think it's very unlikely that the US or, or uh, any other force in NATO or the EU is gonna go to war over Ukraine. Uh, it's Krimoria uh, Bordansik right now. And the other, and they'll be tough, but they're not gonna go to war for it. And I have a very hard time imagining Saudi Arabia, the UAE or anybody else sacrificing their economies and, and the OPEC plus agreements with Russia because of Ukraine. I think Ukraine is pretty much on its own. And the maybe Finland is where the line is being drawn in a, in a more real way. Okay, we've only got a couple of minutes left. So what I'd like to do is have each of you give one last 30 second summary. But I also want you to choose each of you to choose one issue that the audience should be watching carefully from your area for 2022. So let's do it in the same order. Omar, if you could start, please. So what is the one issue that we should be looking at in 2022 uh, that will affect the region? Uh, continuing uh, uh, developments of a energy trade. Uh, I know it's probably we've been talking about most of the day. I think that's probably the most, the best, the best bet. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the the, the crisis that uh, Laurie is, is is living before us uh, and that is affecting many countries in the region. It's it, it can't go on forever, and the only solution is energy trade. So I'd say that. Laurie, what would you say for the coming year? Yeah, definitely. Like as Omar said, I'll be looking at these all oh, the, the energy trades and these all the projects uh, relating uh, or connecting the region. I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, evolution, and hopefully it will continue. I think because it might uh, change the, uh, the the dynamics in the in the region. And definitely, I'll be watching the Vienna talks because it does have an impact on energy. Because if Iran is back, what that 
what does that mean? Uh, there will be more uh, uh, gas or oil coming from uh, Iran. So the impact on the prices, etc. So I think these are the things that I'll be watching for the uh, coming months. And um, Hussein? Yeah, well, the one thing that, that we will know in the coming months, right? And there are many open questions, many things worth watching, but the one thing that will be a result and therefore is really worth paying attention to is the question of the JCPOA. And the resurrection or failure of the JCPOA will do a lot to shape uh, regional and global dynamics regarding the Gulf area and, and the Middle East generally. If it is revived, that opens the door for at least a period of calm and potentially other discussions that may go further or not. But it, 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 it is a, uh, a step towards conciliation. If it fails, the plan B has got to be uh, a new regime of containment against Iran and a real drive to try to resurrect, uh, snap back sanctions, resurrect the global campaign against Iranian nuclear weapons is going to be very hard. And you're going to have to watch the reaction of Tehran's regional proxies in the Arab world, its armed gangs that it maintains. And that's the way it will express its displeasure. It's been doing so since a year after maximum uh, pressure began. And this is the great fault line. And I would watch that. The JCPOA talks in Vienna are the thing that we will know in 12 months and you know, what happened and what impact it had, like for sure. So watch that. All right. I want to thank all of our uh, speakers for their insights, uh, for all the opportunities that they have identified. I want to thank Gulf Intelligence for providing the platform for this discussion and everybody in the audience for taking their time out of their day to join us for what this session uh, has talked about. I hope it has been enlightening. We will see you in future programs and at the AGSIW website, agsiw.org. Thank you all very much. Bye for now.